Okay, welcome back after the break. Um, okay, Lucy says that uh, sister, there might be, uh, there might even be discouragement from inside as a weed making us sick, uh, backsliding. Yes, um, but this weed could be uh, of being, you mean health issues, you mean sick? Uh, or some of the problems and difficulties that we go makes us, uh, you know, um, yes, mentally, physically sick, not well, not healthy, not active, um, and also back, eventually backslide. So what causes sickness? What causes stress? What causes blood pressure? What causes uh, sugar-related issues? Uh, we can't just say it's genetic, but it's also because of a lot of underlining issues or problems or challenges or difficulties that we go through. So we need to uh, know what are those uh, weed, weeds. Uh, we need to deal with those uh, issues at the root, pull it out, so that those don't bring about sickness and pain and suffering and backsliding. Does that help, Lucy? OK, so just before we went for our break, we were looking at the third um, guidepost that is recognize the stirring within. So. As an example, we were looking at Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah was, you know, um, in in Persia. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, many years back had gone, uh, taken uh, the uh, Israelites as captive to Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar died, and the Persian kings conquered, and now they were ruling, and we see Nehemiah is born, but Nehemiah still has a heart for his people for the city of Jerusalem and some of the Jews you know the Persian king had allowed them to go back to Jerusalem to build back their city so people went back they started building their own houses and living there but they were they had not built up the walls and the gates now the walls and gates uh, signify protection signify uh, you know security and is very very important and so many years people have gone back but they have not built the walls of Jerusalem and the gates. Now, what happens when Nehemiah hears this? He starts weeping and mourning. Now, do you think only Nehemiah heard that the walls of Jerusalem are broken down and burned down and the gates are fallen down? Do you think the other, Jew, other Jews did not hear about it? What do you think? The other Jews would have heard about it, yes or no? Yes, because Hanani uh, uh, would have told the others as well. But they would have listened and said, OK, anyways, it was broken down. The gates were broken down. There's nothing we can do. But look at what happens to um, uh, uh, Nehemiah. You know, he hears that the, suppose for you, you know, you are here in Bangalore City, and then you hear that in your place, whether you come from UP or you come from uh, Chhattisgarh or uh, Madhya Pradesh or Kerala or Andhra Pradesh, just imagine you had walls around the city. There are other students here from Andhra, other places, students here from UP. Only you hear that the walls of your city have broken down the gates and you're weeping and mourning and crying and fasting. And the others don't show any kind of sign of um, sadness or pain. There might be little sadness and pain, but they're not reacting like Nehemiah. So why do you think Nehemiah was reacting in this way? It was because God was basically stirring his heart up to do something about it, okay? Everyone saw the problem. Everyone knows the problem. But it was only Nehemiah's heart who was stirred up. That means God was burdening his heart and stirring his, his heart to do something about this program, okay? Or to do something about this wall, sorry. Okay, I'll give an, an example. In, in Bangalore City, we have uh, a place called Auto Rajas. I think it's Home of Hope. You know, it's called it's called Home of Hope, but it's called Auto Rajas Place. We all know it as Auto Rajas Place. So this is this man, Auto, uh, uh, Raja, who drives auto. He basically was a drunkard, and I think he was into a lot of criminal activities, and the Lord touched him. And, you know, when he was driving his auto, he would see, you know, old people and, uh, you know, uh, people destitute just lying on the street. 
he would bring them and he would, you know, they would be really dirty, smelly, uh, sick and having open wounds and all that. He would treat them. He would help them. And, uh, you know, he, God had really stirred his heart up to do something for these people. I was thinking, you know, I see so many people like this, but my heart is not stirred up towards that. But if I see a child crying, my heart would stir up inside me to do something to help that child. Okay. Or if I see a woman in distress, I would go out and reach out to that woman. If I see a child being abused or treated badly or crying or lost, I would stop and I would help that child. But here we see that, you know, Nehemiah had a stirring in his heart. Like all of us travel on the road. How many of us see these women, these people on the streets, no homes, dying without food, sick, you know, just lying there. We just look and we say, how sad. Or we just drop some money, but we won't do anything. But Otto Raja's heart was stirred up and he started a home not very far away from our Bible college called the Home of Hope. If you go there, you will see all these destitute, old, poor people. They're being cared for, being fed and being uh, clothed because his heart was stirred up. God used that stirring in his heart to do something for these people. And he's opened a home for them, which I wouldn't do. Right. So also for Nehemiah, God stirred up his heart, burdened his heart, and he was crying and weeping and mourning, which means God was stirring up his heart to do not just cry and weep and mourn and fast, but to take some action. So we see he fasts and prays and he tells the king and the king gives him uh, permission to go, gives him money, gives him uh, people, uh, gives him wood to build all, all the necessary material that is needed to build a wall, gives him everything and he's able to finish complete, uh, complete uh, uh, and finish building the wall of Jerusalem. Okay, So it was God stirring up his heart. It was not something emotional. Okay, for others, if I was in Nehemiah's time, I would have said, Oh, so sad, you know, we just have to pray to God, God show us mercy. I would just pray one day or two days and then leave it. It's not, it's not an emotional stirring. So sometimes God can stir up your hearts. You, you see people, uh, you, you feel for women who are, uh, you know, beaten up, or pers uh, you know, beaten up by husbands or, you know, widows being treated badly or women being abused. Your heart is tearing up. That means God is not letting your heart be at peace, at rest till you do something about it. Maybe, you know, um, uh, God is stirring up your heart to look at churches where there is disunity, where there is... Um, you know, uh, there's a uh, division, there is fighting, and God is stirring up your heart. I also feel bad about it. I pray about it, but God is stirring up your heart to do something. So God is going to raise you up as a leader to bring about unity and oneness in the uh, churches. Or God is raising you up, uh, you know, you have a burden for your own city, your own place, your own people, you know. Uh, God is stirring up your heart and you go back and you don't give up till you're preaching the gospel in every look and corner of your city. Okay, That is the stirring. It's not an emotional stirring. It's a stirring that God is doing something till you get to that place, till you're doing what he wants you to do, till you start the work and finish what he has called you to do. So look at what Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 12 says. Can somebody read that? It's in your book, Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 12. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 12. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Okay, thank you. So here he says, God, Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem. And what does he say? He says, you know, what God has put in my heart. So all that stirring, that crying, that weeping, that mourning was not emotional. It was God who had put in his heart to do something about the broken walls of Jerusalem. So, for example, you know, um, somebody comes here to Bible college and presents about, uh, you know, um, uh, Af in Afghanistan, you know, how children and women are suffering and all of those things and how people are suffering. Or in any place of the world where people are suffering, um, uh, for example, even Manipur. You know, and we all look at it. Some of us are crying. Some of us are feeling so bad. We go back. We're not able to eat. One or two days, we're praying, crying out to God. Third day, fourth day, we kind of forget about it. 
We pray about it, but it's just there as a burden. But for one or two of you, God is stirring up your heart. Do something about Manipur. Go, you know, uh, go there and help the people. Or, you know, in, uh, or if you're a businessman or a businesswoman, invest, you know, build uh, houses for them, uh, build back the churches. So God is stirring up your heart to do something. It's not emotional. It's not just something crying, but God is putting, uh, you know, God is using that to fulfill his plan and his purpose in and through your life. Okay. Look at... Um, um, what uh, Paul says in Acts chapter 17, verse 16 and 17. Can somebody read that, please? Acts 17, verse 16 and 17. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over, the, over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Yes, so what happens when Paul went to the city of Athens? His spirit was stirred up. Provoked means what? Stirred up. Okay. Why? Because why was his spirit stirred up or provoked? Look into your books and to the Bible. Why was his spirit stirred up and provoked? Because of the because of the idols. And what did he do? He didn't just go and cry out to God for their salvation. What did he do? It moved him into action, right? What did he do? He went to the synagogues and he started preaching to the Jews and the Gentiles about Jesus Christ. Okay, so when there's a stirring in our hearts, it's something deep, it's something lasting, it demands us to take an action okay look at uh, paul and uh, silas and timothy when they had come from macedonia what happened in acts chapter 18 verse 5 it says when silas and timothy had come from macedonia paul was compelled by the spirit and testified to the jews that jesus is the christ okay so here we see that you know he was compelled means he was stirred up in his spirit to prove to testify to show that jesus is the messiah that jesus is the christ jesus is the messiah that they were looking for so why was there a there was a stirring in his heart by whom by god and what was the stirring that led him to do it led him to take some action it it led him to preach the gospel and to testify to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Okay, so don't confuse stirring in your heart to just emotions. Sometimes the stirring is it goes on and on and on. Something that God is burdening your heart about some people group, um, some kind of uh, uh, you know um, uh, city or some problem in our city or towards youth or drug addiction or alcoholism or abuse women or abuse children, whatever it is, slave trade. God is stirring up your heart. It's not just sometimes emotional. If it's a lasting thing, God is actually using that to indicate his plan and purpose and what he wants you to do. Okay. Any questions on this? So God is basically using your heart and stirring and putting his plan and purposes in your heart, you know, and stirring it up so that you are led to do something about it. You move into action and uh, ultimately you're fulfilling his plan and his purpose. Any questions on recognize the stirring within? Okay, I'll just give you an example. I gave you an example of Otto Raja, right? I'll just give you an example of my own life. Uh, you know, when I was, um, I told you I was in this family ministry and I started this project, a new project among schools uh, and built up this project for five years and I had to leave this project, okay? In the end of April uh, uh, in 2007, or 2008, 2008, I left this project. I had to leave it, um, you know, and uh, I left it in April. And then May, for one month, I was just at home, just resting, waiting on God. And in June, you know, schools began. And when schools began, God was just stirring up my heart. He was saying, and I just felt, hey, you know, what am I doing sitting at home? I have to be in school because I, have, I had started this project in schools for children. 
and you know, I have to be in schools ministering to children. And what am I doing here at home? And God was just stirring up my heart. And then, you know, I was praying and was so burdened and said, God, you know, here am I. You know, I have to be in schools ministering to children, but I'm sitting at home. I have no opportunities. I don't know any other ministry where do they, other than Scripture Union where they're doing ministry in schools. God opened doors for me. And God was telling me, you know, send your resume to All People's Church. You know, and when I looked at All People's Church, I went online and saw the employment page. There was nothing for school outreach ministry. There was nothing for children's ministry that they had an opening. And God was sending, telling me, send in your resume. Send in your resume. And I'm saying, God, there is no opportunity there for me to minister among children. And all the opportunities there are for married couples or for people who are you know, in life groups, and I have not done anything in life groups and all of these things. I don't fit in anything. How can I go for an interview if they call me? And God is saying, send in your resume. So I just send my resume and they call me for interview. And I'm like, God, they call me for interview. What do I say? I'm looking for children's ministry. I want to work with children in schools. There's no opportunity here. They're going to laugh at me and I'm going to be the first fool on this earth going for an interview where there is no opening. And I'm saying, please give me an opening. Just, you know, take me in. And God was saying, go for the interview. And I go for the interview. I'm very scared. I'm not, I'm just waiting. When the Lord asked me, for which post have you? apply because I would say I'm not up I, I don't fit in anywhere I've done children's ministry and you know they would get upset and angry with me and you know you wouldn't believe it you know and I'm sitting there they're asking me all about my ministry what I have done and then pastor says you know we have an opening uh, from Ryan International School uh, to do a uh, you know to start a project in in schools for children would you be interested and I was so shocked because this was not on the website, you know, and I didn't know anything about it. And I'm just going for this interview and pastors telling me there is opening like this. Would you like to take it? And I'm just sitting there shocked looking at his face like this. And he's saying there is an opening in children's ministry from Ryan. Would you like to start this ministry? And I'm still looking at him, not giving an answer. He's saying, are you interested? Are you going, will you be willing to take it up? And then I realized and I said, yeah, yes, yes, pastor, I will do it. And when I was walking back home after that, you know, I just had tears just rolling down my face because, you know, God was tearing up my heart for to do something about children in school. And I didn't know how. And I was just saying, God, I have to be in schools now. And I'm here at home. And God himself is opening a door for me and I started this um, catalyst uh, APC school outreach ministry and you know um, uh, wrote the curriculum and we did it in so many schools we're still doing that in many schools okay so Daniel's question is when is the right time to proceed with plan when God is stirring in our heart what should be the first step the first step is to pray like when God was stirring up my heart this you know God, I have to be in schools. I didn't know where to go, what to do. And I was just praying and say, God, open the doors. So you need to pray. And then when you pray, like God showed me, said, send in your resume to All People's Church. I didn't know All People's Church at that time. I was not worshiping there. Um, and then, you know, God just opened the doors. So when God stirs up our heart, he knows the exact time. He'll open the doors. We just need to be faithful. We need to just be the right time, the right place. And he will just uh, open the doors. Like Nehemiah, you know, uh, Nehemiah fasted and prayed, but he was very sad. And one fine day, the king looked at him and said, hey, Nehemiah, why are you so sad? Because God just opening the door for him. And Nehemiah just told the problem. And, you know, the king just, uh, God made a way through the king and provided everything that he uh, needed. Okay. APC's college has a children's ministry project? No, APC, the church, has a school outreach ministry called Catalyst. Yes, not, a, not the APC Bible College, but uh, APC as a church has a school outreach ministry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so Sanjay says, thank you for sharing this testimony, ma'am, because I was wondering if God had, tru had truly called me to Bible college. I says, I'm a late learner. It's never too late uh, to learn. I'm also still learning. I'm teaching, fulfilling God's purpose for so many years, but I still prepare three, four hours every time I come to this class. And, you know, still preparing, still learning, um, and still improving in the way I'm teaching. Okay. Okay, Any more? anyone else has more questions? Yes.
how to know that it's our emotion or uh, or god is stirring to us okay how do you know it's emotion or uh, it's god stirring if it's god stirring it will not stop it will continue in various ways god will bring pictures dreams he will open opportunities you will land up in ministry you're walking on the street you will see things you will god will burden your heart when you're praying you will just cry out for these people but if it's an emotion it will just be one or two days and you'll forget about it but if it's a stirring it will continue till you know that's why paul says i have taken hold of what god has taken hold of me in spite of all the difficulties challenges you know god has taken hold of paul about something he's taken hold of that he's continuing to run his race so it, that burden will not stop till you do what you have to do so even when i was doing the previous project which i started in this uh, family ministry it was something that i started it was my own project it was very close to my heart it was like my baby but i had to leave it i had to give it up i was very hard broken but you know god knows our hearts and see he's opened an opportunity for me in apc and i started another school outreach ministry uh, which i'm doing now from 2008 see right okay anyone else has any questions if not we'll move on to the next um the fourth um um you know guide post how god shows us his plan and purpose for our life is to recognize the grace of god given to you now this is a little difficult to understand so i want you to pay attention carefully please what do you mean by the grace of god what does the word grace mean or what do we mean by when we say grace of god huh sorry blessed grace means blessed sorry favor yes favor lucy thank you okay god's the word grace in the bible is used in three different contexts in the new testament first god's grace refers to divine favor what is the meaning of divine favor divine favor means divine acceptance which means god accepts us just the way we are okay so the word grace in the new testament is used in three different contexts the first one is divine favor or divine acceptance which means god accepts us just the way we are ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 can somebody read that please ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god yes so it is by grace that we have been saved through faith and it's not by anything that we have done it's not by our works it's a gift of god the second context that grace is used in the new testament is talks about divine character that means it talks about the character of god we read in john chapter 1 verse 14 it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as uh, uh, the glory begotten of the father full of grace and truth okay so the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us and we beheld his glory as that of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth so here in this context grace represents the character of god So what is the character of God mentioned here in John chapter 1 verse 14 that God is full of grace and truth so grace and truth is basically the character of God okay uh, look at what uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 says can somebody read that 2 Peter, Peter. Yeah, go ahead, Lucy. You can read. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. So we see that even as grace is the character of God, we are all called, as it says in Second Peter chapter three, verse eighteen, we are all called uh, to grow in this grace and in the knowledge of 
Jesus Christ, which means we're all called to grow into Christ likeness. Okay. So the second thing is uh, grace uh, in the context as it's mentioned in the New Testament is about divine character is the character of God. The third way grace is mentioned or the third context that grace is mentioned in the New Testament, it's mentioned in the context of divine empowerment and divine enablement. Okay, empowering, divine God empowering us, giving us the power, enabling us to do what he wants us to do. Okay, helping us, aiding us, strengthening us, uh, helping us to fulfill the call and the purpose that he has for our lives. And the example is uh, we can look at is about Paul. Now, you know, Paul had a thorn in his flesh and it says it's repeated attacks from the enemy and he cries out to God for help and what does God say he tells God please take this thing away I can't handle this thorn in my flesh okay uh, and what does God say okay Paul I'll remove it for you what does he no, say he says my grace is sufficient for you he says my grace is sufficient for you which means God is saying hey Paul my grace is divine enablement, it's divine empowerment. Even as you go through this struggle, these repeated attacks of the enemy, you know, I am going to enable you, I am going to empower you, I am going to strengthen you, okay? Now look at what Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 says. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7. Can somebody read that please? Gertrude, would you like to read that? Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 but to each, each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift yes so what has been given to each one of us what has been given to each one of us grace so every person every believer God has given us grace so tell your neighbor God has given you grace online students you can say God has given me grace can you tell your neighbor, God has given you grace? Okay. So to each one, God has given us grace according to what? According to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay. So every one of us, God has extended divine enablement. This divine enablement is related to Christ's gift given to us. So we can safely say that Jesus Christ has given us one or more gifts to each one of us. So God has not created any of you useless or hopeless. He has given each one of you one or more gifts. But it says here to each one, please listen carefully and understand, to each one is given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. So which means... Each person has received some gift and there is a grace that comes upon us, which is divine enablement that has come upon us and that is connected or related to the gifts that Christ has given to us. Now, the Bible says, according to the measure of Christ's gift, meaning there are different measures of the same gift. Don't... Uh, Get confused all of us are given gifts okay one or more gifts okay but each one of us are given one or more gifts but we can also have different measures of the same gift now for example how many of you are in this class total number of students in in-person students how many of you 24 okay say 24 students now just say all of you 24 students are given the gift of leadership. Okay. But all of you, I think, like worship. All of you are given leadership. Okay. You're given the gift of leadership. But we all have the same gift of leadership. You know, some of you have the leadership of teaching God's word. Some of you have the leadership of leading in praise and worship. So we all have the same gift, but different measures of the same gift, okay? Uh, some of you can, um, you know, also have measures in the sense, some of you can have a greater measure 
of a leadership skill. Okay, you can be you know, the measure that you receive is a bit more stronger, is a bit more greater in your influence, a greater anointing. Okay, compared to somebody else. So if you look at, there are so many worship leaders in our world, but we see that some of them have a greater sense of greater anointing, a greater influence. Um, they are much more stronger in the gift compared to another worship leader. So all of us, even though we can be worship leaders, we have different measures of the same gift, different anointing, different greater levels of influence okay so some of us could have a lesser uh, a measure a lesser anointing some of us have can have a greater a bigger a really huge a really big gifting and anointing in that same gift whether it's leadership whether it is um, preaching or teaching whether it's um, uh, you know doing children's ministry youth ministry we can all have different measures some of us can have small some of us can have little some of us can have you know little more greater some of us can have bigger some of us really huge and big but the measure the important thing to know is that god is not partial okay romans chapter 2 verse 11 says god is not partial so even in this measure that he gives us of the same gift he's not partial okay the measure christ gives us is more than sufficient for us to fulfill the plan and purpose he has given us so don't compare with each other don't be jealous of each other if you if you make all the worship leaders in this world stand on the same platform we can know that some people have greater anointing say greater you know um influence uh greater leading you know i just listened to one church and they just had their um, worship uh, you know seminar just got over and the main worship pastor wrote nine songs in just one or two days of that worship seminar his wife wrote eight songs i was like wow nine songs eight songs you know so they might have a greater and a bigger influence a measure of anointing Somebody else who attended the same worship conference could have written one song. Somebody couldn't, wouldn't have even completed writing one song. It doesn't mean that God is partial. What it means here is what the measure of gift that grace that God has given to you is more than sufficient for you to fulfill his plan and purpose for your life. So we need to be happy with whatever measure we have because it's more than enough it's what you need and it's all that you need to fulfill the purpose of God for your life. So don't be jealous of somebody who has a bigger measure of the gift. Why does God give them a bigger measure of the gift? Because God has given them bigger responsibility. Okay. They've got more work to do than what you have to do. If you are in that same place with that bigger responsibility, that big work that God has given to you, he would have given you the same measure of anointing. But you are not in that same place of big responsibility or big work. So he's given you the measure that is sufficient for you in that place. But if you grow to that place of bigger responsibility or bigger power of more work, then God is also going to increase the measure of grace that uh, you need the, the greater measure of enablement and empowerment that you need okay look at romans chapter 12 verses 4 to 6 can somebody read that please get through do you wanted to read that romans 12 4 to 6 romans chapter 2 no, one minute uh, get through will read get through will you read that please okay, she's not here she wanted to read last time you can go ahead and read yeah Romans chapter 12, verse 4 to 6. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. In prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Amen. Thank you. So here it says, we, uh, for as we have many members in one body. What is the body is talking here? Church, the body of Christ. So in the body of Christ, there are many 
members. So do all of them have the same function? Do all, are all the members of the church worship leaders? Are all the people in the church musicians? Are all the people in the church evangelists or missionaries? No, we have some evangelists, some missionaries, some children's church workers, some youth workers, some who lead worship, some who play instrument, uh, some who do social work. So, you know, some are called to be pastors, apostles, leaders, administrators, helpers. So different functions in the same body of uh, Christ. So we are all part of one body we all have one one function or more than one function and it's and we are all together uh, you know functioning together to build up the body of christ okay so no member can say hey i don't have any function because god's word says that we all have a function okay and we've all got to perform our function in the body of Christ. So we just don't go to church and sit down and come back, but we have a function uh, to build, enhance, enrich the church, and also to build, enhance, extend God's kingdom here on earth. So verse 5 says, you know, look at verse 5. What does verse 5 say? So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Okay? Which means even though we are individuals, even though we have our own specific function, you know, our functions are interlinked, they're intertwined. Just for example, my arm cannot say, hey, I don't need you body, I'm just going to leave you and I'm going to do things on my own. Can the arm function? No. Can the body function without the arm? No. The arm cannot do that. Okay. So even as we have our own functions, we are all interlinked. We are all dependent on each other. So all of your functions are important to build up the body of Christ, or the functioning of the body of uh, Christ. And we can't do one without the other. And we're all dependent upon each other. And we're dependent on each other for us or the church to run successfully. Just imagine the pastor comes, he has to sweep, he has to do mic setup, he has to do sound setup, he has to put the chairs, he has to make the tea, coffee, preach, serve communion, serve tea, coffee, wish people, pray for people. Is it possible? No, it's, it's impossible. Okay, so we understand that while we all have some functions, our functions are interlinked, intertwined, we are members of one another, we, we are somehow we relate to each other, we are dependent on each other, we are not disconnected because that is how God has designed us. Okay, look at verse 6. It says, having then, what does it mean saying having then? Meaning now, because all of us know that we have a function, we've all got gifts to match our functions. It says, having then gifts, why do you think gifts are given? Why do you think God gives us gifts? To fulfill the function that he wants us to fulfill in the body of Christ or in the kingdom of God or here on earth. So he says, having then, which means, now, because you've got a function, you've got gifts to match your function. So having then, you have to fulfill your function. Okay. So why do you think gifts are given? Gifts are given to fulfill our function. So if you find out what is your gift that God has given to you, it will tell you what is your function in the body of Christ. If your, you know, if your gift is preaching and teaching, then you know your function in the body of Christ is what? To preach and to teach. If your, if your gift is praying for people, you know what is your function in the body of Christ? What is your function? To join the prayer group or to lead the prayer group. If your gift is uh, playing instruments, you know what is your function? You are part of the music team, worship team. If your gift is to lead worship, you know what is your function? Okay. So once we know our gifts, that will help us to fulfill our function okay and then he says having then gifts deferring okay which means we've all been given different gifts okay but the gifts you've been given are more than enough to help you to fulfill the function in the body of christ are you understanding me yes no yes 
Okay, so we saw that we are all part of the body of Christ. We all have a function, and each of our function is important. We are interlinked. And how do we know our function by knowing our? How do we know our function by knowing our gift? So once we know our gift, we will be able to fulfill our function in the body of Christ. And then he says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So the gifts that are given to us are given according to the grace of Jesus Christ that is extended in our lives to fulfill that particular function. Just as I explained, right? There are different measures of the same gift, but whatever measure God has given to us that is sufficient to fulfill our calling, to su sufficient to fulfill what God's plan and purpose for our life is. So we need to use our gifts to know what is our function. We can't just put it on the shelf and leave it there. We need to use the gifts. We need to use the grace of God because when we use them, we will be able to fulfill your, our function in the body of Christ. Okay. Now, just some simple analysis here. Okay. Now, uh, I'm not gifted to play a musical instrument. Okay. I love to sing. I love to be part of the worship uh, team. But I know that, you know, I can sing well, but I can't, you know, suddenly change to alto, soprano. Sometimes I find it difficult to listen to the right uh, chord and start the song. And I also don't play a musical instrument. So I can't say, hey, God has gifted me to be a worship leader. Though I love worship, though I love singing, though I love to worship God, I can't say God has gifted me to be a worship leader. You know, if you say that, we're actually fooling God and I'm fooling myself and I'm fooling people because God has not gifted me in that area. When I see people sing the way they worship, the way they play the instruments, you know, I just admire them. That's a gift that God has given them. But I know the areas God has gifted me. He's gifted me in the area of ministering to children. So, you know, when I see things, God doing things to me, I'm just amazed. And I know that this is his gift, his grace, his enablement, his empowerment, his favor that is enabled me enabling me to use the gift that he's given me, the seed that is he's given me to fulfill the function in the body of Christ. Are you able to understand? Yes? Okay. So um, let's look at your notes that is uh, in your book. Okay. Uh, let's read these things, some of the indicators. Okay. The gifts in our, the gifts in our life are indicative of the grace that is given to you the gifts given to you are in line with the function god has designed for you to perform in the body the gifts and callings of god go together you know you're called to a particular function when you have the gifts to help you fulfill that function okay and not all gifts are spiritual in nature Okay. Now we know that Romans chapter 11 verse 29 says, and the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Okay, what's the meaning of irrevocable? The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, means they are final, they are fixed. Okay, you can't change them. Okay, so, you know, the calling of God is always, when God calls you to do something, it's always accompanied by your gifting the areas that you are talented in, okay? You cannot be called to a certain function if you don't have the gifts that correspond to that function. You cannot say God has called me to be a worship leader when you can't sing, when you can't match the right chords, when you can't, you know, you don't have the musical mind, when you're not able to lead people in the right note, you're singing all off tune. You can't say God has called me to be a worship leader. Okay, so when God calls you to do something, he, it is accompanied by the gifts that he's given to you. And, you know, it is also corresponds with the, uh, the, the specific gifts and the calling that he has for your life. Okay, um, so if you're called to do something, the gifting will also be there because the gifts and the call of God go together. Right. We read in Romans chapter 11 verse 29. Okay, now let's look at Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 9. Can somebody read that, please? Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 9.
Any online student would like to read Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 9? Any online student, can you please read? Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 9, please. Nobody wants to read, online students? I'll okay. read them. Yeah. Yes. Romans 12, 4 to 9. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Above what is evil, cling to what is good. Amen. Thank you, Sonia. So he says here that, you know, we have all these different functions and you will, and uh, like the last point we read, not all gifts are spiritual in nature. Okay, not all gifts are spiritual in nature. Now, for example, you know, oh, what do we mean by this? All gifts are not spiritual in nature means, you know, for example, all of us in this room, 25 of us can, you know, be have the gifts of leadership. Okay, but all of our gifts in leadership will not be spiritual in nature. For example, you now some of you will be a leader in preaching God's word. Some of you can be a leader in prayer, which is spiritual. But some of you can be a team leader in your workplace, in a secular job. Some of you can be a project leader. It's not a spiritual job like uh, preaching God's word or praying. You can be a leader of an organization, a secular organization. You can be a leader of a sports team. You can be a leader of a music team outside church. I'm not talking worship team, music team. You can also be a leader of a political team, a political party. Okay, So you can, all of these is leadership positions, but it's not spiritual in nature. Are you getting what I'm saying? Yes, okay, it's not uh, uh, spiritual in nature, but that does not mean that this is not God's gift for you. Yes, this is Christ's gift for you. But you can use this even in the secular place or even in the world. You can use this gift that God has given you as a leader to enhance God's kingdom values, his principle, bring about godly standards, bring about holiness, even as you are a leader in the secular place or even as you are a leader in a political party. You can still bring about God's rule, his reign, his presence, his word, his standards, his values. You can still bring it. Um, about okay so uh, it does not mean that you know only that you know gifts that god has given us is for just for within the church's context but also can be in the secular place the worldly place but god can use it to bring about his kingdom values even in the world that we um, live in and look at this verse in verses uh, six seven eight it says you know we all have different gifts if it's the gift of prophecy prophesy. If it is, uh, you know, serving, serve. If it's teaching, teach. If it's encouraging, encourage. If it's giving, give. If it's leading, you know, uh, lead. If it's, um, uh, you know, showing mercy, do it cheerfully. So we see that, you know, prophecy, we can look at as spiritual, you know, helping, administration, you know, giving generously. All of these things is not very spiritual in nature, but is also the gifts also something that God can use to build his kingdom, okay? So he says, you know, we all have different functions, but you will find that all functions are not spiritual in, uh, in nature, okay? Um, I'll just stop here. Daniel says, does a gift exist in which a person does everything on his own instead of different gifted person working together? Sorry, I didn't understand your question, Daniel. Um, does a gift exist in which a person does everything? Or oh, you mean in the context of a church? Are you saying that uh, the gift that God gives a person, he does everything on his own? No, that's what I'm saying. You know, our gifts, 
uh, are interlinked, intertwined. It's not just we have one person who can lead worship or just one person in church who can pray. There are many people, but all of us coming together, you know, using our gifts to enhance, uh, to build and uh, to fulfill the function in that specific area in the church. Does that help, Daniel? Okay. Okay, we'll stop here. It's time up. Um, anyone else has any questions? If there are no questions, then we'll end class. Thank you, everyone, for joining class. Have a good weekend.